So today we're going to talk about two of the most burning questions in, um, in physics in, in, in regards to the physical universe. Uh, these are questions that I have been asking myself for 10, 20, maybe even 30 years, but these are questions that I've specifically been trying to answer for at least the last 10 years throughout my research uh, into the fractal nature of the universe. Um, so these two questions, I think you'll recognize them right away. These are probably the same burning questions that you have. And that is, um, what is mass and what is charge? Mass and charge <clears throat> are extremely elusive. Okay, the concepts of mass and the concepts of charge are extremely elusive. Now, we do have a better sense. I think we have a, a more clear sense of what mass is. The sensation, we, can ha we have direct experience with the sensation of mass. When I pick up a cup, which I'm actually doing right now, I can feel the, the weight of it. Okay, I can feel, you know, gravity pulling it down towards the table. Okay, I can hear it hit the table when I put my cup down. There are a lot of sensations involved in the experience of mass. And so I think we all have a pretty good sensation of what mass is. And the same with charge. I think <clears throat> we all have personal experience with charge. Um, when we're, when we're kids, we're taught that when, if you take a balloon and you rub it on your hair and then you can stick the balloon to the wall and there is something, a sensation you can feel, you can feel the balloon stuck to the wall. Um, you, you know, we are told that that is, um, what we're experiencing there is charge, but answering the question, what is mass? And what is charge? Um, is it's a very difficult thing to do. Okay, I've been trying to answer these two questions for these these specific questions for years and years, and um, you know I still I am still seeking proper answers to these questions. Okay, so you know mainstream has lots of descriptions about what is mass and what is charge. They have definitions. They have um, a language that they based around it, but uh, none of those things are satisfying to me. I'm not satisfied with the answers that mainstream gives of, you know, what is mass and what is charge. Okay, so, um, so we're going to investigate this further as time goes on, but, um, but in reality, in reality, I believe that the actual questions that we want answers to um, are, you know, why is mass and why is charge? Why does mass exist? Why does charge exist? Why do we need mass and charge? You know, why does the universe need, um, why, do, why does the universe need something called mass, something that we experience as mass and, and charge? Okay, why do we need both of these things? So these are the philosophical questions. The what is mass and what is charge are the scientific questions, are scientific questions. Okay, we want, you know, to know what is going on. So science measures mass and measures charge and they tell us, you know, what these things are to some extent. Um, but the questions, <clears throat> why is mass and why is charge, these are more philosophical questions. And uh, to me, I, I you know, want answers. This is what I want uh, answers for. I want to understand why does mass exist and why does charge exist? Why is mass, um, why does charge have plus and minus, but mass doesn't have plus and minus? Why, you know, why is mass... Um, have inertia, but charge doesn't seem to have inertia. Uh, in other words, when you when you turn on an electrical circuit, charge starts moving right away, and when you turn off the circuit, it stops moving right away. 
It's not like the particles, you know, when you turn off a circuit, the particles don't bump into each other. Whatever charge is, that doesn't seem to be going on in an electrical circuit. But if you have water flowing down a river and then you stop, if, if you somehow could stop it, all the particles would bump into each other and, you know, you would have the sensation of inertia. And so why does the universe need mass and charge? Okay, so that's that's the question I'm going to try to answer using the principle of incommensurability. So science is about description and philosophy is about explanation. Now I know you've heard Ken Wheeler say that descriptions are not explanations and this is completely true. But it is my opinion that science is about developing descriptions of things and philosophy is about developing explanations of things, or at the very least, um, plausible explanations. So uh, possible or plausible explanations. So philosophy isn't about, you know, explaining things absolutely. Philosoph philosophy is about explaining things plausibly. Okay, no one can explain things absolutely. In fact, no one can really describe things absolutely. Um, you can describe things relative to other things, but you cannot describe things absolutely and you cannot explain things absolutely. And so for the people that are trying to, you know, tell me not to do philosophy, that philosophy is religion or philosophy is, is not worthwhile, um, I'm sorry, but I need to answer these burning questions. Why is mass and why is charge? And in order to do that, um, I need to uh, take a philosophical approach. There is not going to be a, an absolute answer to this, but what I couldn't, what I might be able to offer you is a plausible um, explanation for why, um, why mass and charge must exist in the universe. So here is what I came up with. Okay, this was a little, a bit of an, a revelation, or you might wanna say an epiphany that I had uh, a little while back uh, while cooking dinner. Sometimes I get, you know, uh, interesting thoughts when I'm not thinking about this stuff. And this popped into my head and I went, oh, that's interesting. And so um, what I'm going to, in terms of the principle of incommensurability, I'm going to say that mass and charge are incommensurate principles. And I'm going to put them into the matrix like this. Uh, this is the complex matrix. And now this is, this is just a, uh, you know, sort of a graphical representation of the, um, the difference between mass and charge. And so as you well know, mass is a scalar. And so in terms of the, you know, complex uh, numbers, if I were going to put mass into a complex number, I would put it on the forward diagonal. And of course, as you well know, charge uh, has a positive component and a negative component. And so if charge, um, you know, if I was going to put charge into a complex number, I would put it on the backward diagonal. Okay, mass is a scalar and charge is a uh, is polarized. It's got a plus and a minus, and so it belongs on the backward diagonal. Now, the interesting thing here is this, you know, this explains why mass and charge can coexist. Mass and charge coexist in the matrix, okay, in this matrix. Mass and charge can coexist in this matrix, and therefore mass and charge can coexist in the universal matrix. Okay, mass is real and charge is imaginary. And so this is, this is where I don't really mind using the words real and imaginary because mass is, is real. It's more real. Again, when I pick up my cup, I feel the mass and it's very, very real. Um, charge is a little more elusive. We can have personal experience, real experience with charge, but in my mind, charge is much more imaginary. It's, it's much more um, elusive, or sorry, charge is much more elusive than mass. Okay, so mass is, is real and charge is imaginary in, um, in the principle. Okay, 
So this was the revelation. This is this uh, sort of answered my question. This basically answered my question: Why does mass and charge, you know, have to exist? Why does the universe have to have something called mass and something called charge? Because the principle of incommensurability demands that it be so. So, it, so I would put mass on the forward diagonal and charge on the backward diagonal, and I would call mass real, and I would call charge imaginary. And so, um, as we know, mass cannot exist without char mass can exist without charge. We can have particles that aren't charged, um, but charge cannot exist without mass. And this may not even be true. Mass, it's possible that mass can't exist without charge, that these two must coexist. When you have neutral charges, you, it's just because you have balanced charges. So balanced charges aren't neutral charges are just a positive and negative together in balance. And so um, mass and charge coexist. They coexist, okay. Particles have a property called mass, and particles also have the property called charge. And so, um, so matter particles atoms, electrons, whatever you want to call them. I'm just going to call it matter. So matter particles have the property of mass and they have a property of charge. And the property of mass and the property of charge can coexist in the particle, can coexist in the uh, matrix of the particle. And so, um, so that is uh, the answer to my question uh, why is mass and why is charge? Um, why do they exist and why do they coexist? Why do we need something called mass and something called charge? And why do particles have the property of mass and the property of charge? And by the way, black holes also have the property of mass and the property of charge is uh, because of the principle of incommensurability. And so uh, mainstream is keen on blaming everything on relativity. They, they would say, oh, it's a relativistic effect. Or they might say, oh, charge is a quantum effect and mass is a relativistic effect. And so um, I am going to blame everything on the principle of incommensurability. Okay, mass and charge. Uh, the universe needs something... Uh, like mass and something like charge in order to exist, in order to persist, in order to create. The other thing I want to point out is that um, charge, because charge is on the backward diagonal, charge is going to be associated with spin. And of course we know that particles um, have a property of spin and black holes also have a property of spin. And so um, spin kind of comes for free in this setup when you, uh, when you associate mass with the real component and charge with the imaginary component of a complex um, space, of a complex number. And so it is my opinion that we live in a complex universe. Not only is the universe complicated, but complex numbers can be used to tell us a lot about how the universe works and even maybe answer some of the questions such as um, such as why why mass and why charge. Now I still can't tell you exactly what these things are, but I know that they must exist and they must coexist in order for the universe to exist. And I got this. I I came to this understanding by studying the Mandelbrot set and by uh, developing the principle of incommensurability. So um, so that is all I wanted to say. This is again just a sketch. Most of my um, the videos on the principle are just going to be one idea at a time. I don't want to throw too much much at you at once because it's going to be confusing. So one piece of puzzle at the time. Eventually over time the uh, picture of the puzzle is going to appear and you're going to have a eureka moment like I did and go Ah, now I get it. So I hope that happens. I hope that happens. And so that is why I'm going to continue making these videos. I hope that someday you have the same sensation that I had, the eureka moment, the revelation that 
you have a good feeling or understanding for what is going on. So um, have a good day and uh, I'll be back.